A site that never fails to impress me is the incredible ruins of Corfe Castle, which is set between the Purbeck Hills in Dorset. Once a large stronghold and often described as a medieval skyscraper, this much-loved castle has been owned by many notable figures in history. Many sieges have also taken place here. The following is a timeline of the history of Corfe Castle. Archaeological findings suggest that the Duratriges, a Celtic tribe who settled in and around the Dorset area, used the southern edge of Cor for farming. Several burial mounds can also be found just outside the village. During the Roman occupation of Britain, Corf and other parts of the Isle of Purbeck most likely became an area for trading, as large amounts of copper and pottery from the period were later found. As the Romans left, Fierce warriors consisting of the Germanic tribes, and some from modern-day Denmark, started to arrive and settle in Britain. They would later be known as the Anglo-Saxons, and this is where Corfe Castle would start to take its shape. Around the time of Alfred the Great, the Isle of Purbeck became a large target for Viking attacks, especially at the nearby fortified town of Wareham, where it was sieged and occupied in 875 AD by the Great Summer Army, commanded by the famous Guthrum the Old. This conflict briefly ended a year later in 876 AD, with the Vikings making peace with Alfred, who in return swore that they would leave Wessex undisturbed. Although the Vikings would leave Wareham, they would go and cause more havoc by sneaking under the cover of darkness and attacking the city of Exeter. To make sure that the Vikings wouldn't attack the Isle of Purbeck again, Alfred decided to build a wooden fort, which would have included a large Saxon hall. We know this because archaeologists have found wooden post holes beneath where it once stood. Maybe the most horrific event at Corfe Castle was on the 18th of March 978 AD, when King Edward the Matar came to visit his wicked stepmother Elfrida, along with his stepbrother Ethelred. After the death of Edward's father and Elfrida's third husband, Edgar the Peaceful, this caused a subsequent struggle between the family. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Elfrida offered Edward some poisonous wine as he arrived at the gates of Corfe. A source suggested that he was stabbed straight after. Of course, Elfrida may have not personally pulled off the attack and instead enlisted the help of a guard or an assassin. After, we know that Edward's body was said to have been hastily buried in Wareham, until a year later in 979 AD, where it was relocated to Shaftesbury Abbey, and this time given a proper ceremony. It was at this point that Edward would become a saint, as he was described as to have been a representation of an innocent victim for power and prestige. In the end, we know that the cause of the ambush was to put Elfrida's son, Ethelred, on the throne of England, who of course would later be remembered as Ethelred the Unready. After the Battle of Hastings in 1066, the newly crowned William the Conqueror set to build more defences around England, especially coastal defences. According to the Doomsday Book, William acquired the land from the Abbot of Shrewsbury, Corfe Castle's originated Saxon fort was upgraded. It may have firstly been upgraded to the new Norman invention of a Mott and Bailey castle, then later built over with Purbeck limestone, quarried just a few miles away. 
Of course, this also helps to build the outer bailey, the dungeons and the Norman Hall. This construction would make it one of the first castles made from stone in England, indicating that it had a very high status. At the beginning of the 12th century, Henry I continued to fortify the castle by beginning the construction of the stone keep. This took just over nine years at a rate of three to four metres per year. He would also see to expand the castle walls by making them massively thick. It was at this point that Corfe would become one of the most impregnable fortresses in the kingdom. Sometime after the conflict against his older brother Robert at the Battle of Toshbray, Henry imprisoned his brother at Corfe Castle. After the death of Henry I in 1135, England was dragged into civil war between the cousins Stephen and Matilda to claim the English throne. After the death of his uncle Henry, Stephen quickly made his way to Westminster to get crowned, whilst Matilda was in France. In 1139, Baldwin de Redvers, one of Empress Matilda's supporters, was ordered to take Corfe Castle from Stephen. His large army crossed the channel from Anjou in France and landed at Wareham. However, he was unable to utilise Wareham as a base, so swiftly moved on to Corfe. Luckily for Baldwin, the garrison at Corf would turn against Stephen and then started to side with Matilda. Upon hearing of the seizure of Corf, Stephen acted to personally take it back. His army would have been a considerable size to storm the castle, although he realised that the castle's fortified strength and defensive capabilities would cut straight through his army, so instead proceeded with a long siege. He ordered his engineers to build a siege tower on top of the nearest hill. Its remains can still be seen today. While Stephen was distracted sieging Corfe, Empress Matilda, along with her brother Robert the Earl of Gloucester, set to take the crown back by invading England. Their army, consisting of only 140 knights, landed at Arundel on the 30th of September. Upon hearing of his rival cousin's invasion, Stephen hastily abandoned his siege works and marched straight to Arundel. During the reign of Richard I, better known as Richard the Lionheart, Corfe Castle started to undergo maintenance rather than large building work done by the previous kings. However, unlike his older brother, King John would spend large amounts of money and time to make his stay at Corfe Castle luxurious. Financial records show that between 1201 and 1204, over £750 was spent on rebuilding the defences of the West Bailey, whilst £250 was spent on constructing a Gloriette, which was a sort of mini palace inside the Inner Bailey. As for the Outer Bailey, an additional £500 was spent on enlarging it and making it more secure. John's final payment at Corfe Castle summed up to about £1,400. This may be to build the curtain wall and towers. In total, John spent just over £2,925 in today's money, although back in medieval times, this would amount to hundreds of thousands or maybe millions. Few castles that John helped to construct or even tasked to upgrade would become so significant. Clearly John loved the castle dearly, as he once kept the crown jewels and other fabulous treasures here. As well as being one of the strongest castles in England, Corfe Castle's state prison was also a convenient place to lock up political prisoners. King John's niece, Eleanor the Duchess of Brittany, along with 25 knights were imprisoned by John, who believed that Eleanor posed a threat to his throne. Fortunately, she was only under house arrest, meaning she was able to roam around the castle. As for the knights, however, they weren't so lucky. After a breakout attempt, they were quickly thrown into the dungeon, where 22 of them starved to death. Although the records aren't exact, Eleanor spent more than 30 years at Corth Castle, becoming the longest person from the royal bloodline to be imprisoned. Other than Eleanor, there have been other historical figures to be kept at Corth Castle. Margaret and Isabel, the daughters of King William I of Scotland, were briefly prisoners here, then later released. Maud de Braise, along with her son William, were transferred from Windsor Castle to Corfe Castle, 
This was after Maud made comments regarding the murder of John's nephew Arthur. Both of them would starve under John's orders. After his forced abdication, there's even evidence to suggest that Edward II of England was once imprisoned at Corfe and was transferred to Berkeley Castle where he would later die. Even Simon de Montfort's son was captured and locked up at Corfe Castle after a disagreement with King John. Few people would come to mourn John's death in 1216, but his legacy lives on through his spectacular building work at Corfe Castle.